first of all, welcome everybody. Um, just so a little bit of background. Um, I, I'm one of the people who teaches here and also um, working on, on a PhD in philosophy as well. But uh, anyway, it's always great having next groups, having your, your groups here. Um, like I said, my preferences will take a bunch of questions rather than just start with one, because that gives me more of a sense of the types of things that people are bothered by or interested in. So off to you, over to you, whatever it is that's on your mind, you've thought of that you'd like to have discussed off. Just give me, a, how much time do we have? Just uh... We've got a fair hour. Minutes. Okay, we can get through quite a lot in 45 minutes then. Good. So what are your questions? What are your thoughts? What are you bothered by? What's on your mind? Yeah, just tell me your names when you ask as well. Charlie. Charlie, okay, good, yeah. Charlie, yes. I'm wondering what your thoughts on abortion. Because I know lots of rabbis have different opinions. Okay, rabbis have different opinions on abortion. That's good. Good. Nice question, Charlie. Well, what else? What, are, what other questions do we have? I'll ask a question. Okay, go on. It's the biggest challenge that you know you're growing up in today's society. Okay. Um, you know, okay. Good. That's question number two. What else do we have? What's on, what's on our minds? What are we? Yeah. Just your name as well, sorry. Olivia, yeah. Guys, can we just listen to each other's questions, please? Yeah, shh. You're going How can you, like, see the good of God when so many bad things happen in the world? How do you see the good in God when so much bad happens? Okay, good. Do, are we okay to close the door? Just less uh, noise. Great. These are good questions. Any other, what else do we have on our questions list? What else is on our, our minds? We can have more as we roll through, but it's good to start with a few more. So that's, yeah. Um, Just your name, sorry? Um, it's Alex. Alex, okay, great. Uh, how the concept was initiated with work? Okay, so we've got so far four questions. I've right, got uh, Charlie's question about abortion, Olivia's question about, well, your question about, uh, about challenges for teenagers. Um, question now about, uh, Olivia's question about how could we believe in the goodness of God when there's so much bad? And Alex's question about Mashiach. Right, what, anything specific about it or just generally how it's going to be? Okay, great. So let's start with these four and then we can throw in more as we go. Let's talk a little bit about Jewish view of abortion. When I say Jewish, there's lots of Jewish groups. I'm talking about the halachic view, right? Jewish law. There might be non-halachic views and so on. The halachic view is essentially, you have to sum it up, you would say a fetus, because in the end, all abortion debate depends on the status of a fetus. Because all the good arguments in favor of liberalizing the laws and allowing abortions um, would, would agree that you can't use the same arguments to terminate a child who's actually born. Or at least almost everybody agrees. Even if there's a psychological need or something. Um, so really speaking, the question is what's the status of the fetus? Is it like a, a child is born? Is it like just the cell? And by the way, every secular legal system has to deal with this problem too. Most legal systems in the world would treat a nine-month-old fetus more or less the same, very close to a actual living born child, right? Almost every legal system would consider a partially born baby to be considered fully uh, legally alive and so on. Let me tell you in Jewish law where this comes up, because when most of the texts of Jewish law were written, you couldn't have modern abortion procedures. Uh, so a lot of the abortions were done either. In those days, they, they got the, what do they used to do, let's say, in the non-Jewish world in those days. They, there was a lot of infanticide. Lots of babies were killed to keep populations under control. You see that not just in the archaeological record, you see it in Aristotle's writings, for example. We, Judaism was never allowed that. But... What you do have the question of in the Talmud is what happens if the mother's life is in danger and the only way to save a mother is to terminate the pregnancy. And the halacha is as follows, the mission in Ahalos, and the halacha is that once the child is partly born, once the, let's say the head is out, and, and uh, at that point you can't kill the, feet, kill the baby to save the mother. Up till that point you can, right? What's the difference? is that a fetus in the womb of the mother is not considered a full life like a child is born, okay? However, it's not considered nothing. And therefore, um, what's today called abortion on demand would not be allowed in Judaism. There'd have to be a good reason. Now, a good reason is very hard to define, okay? Obviously, the life or limb of the mother comes above the fetus. Uh, the psych certain level of psychological well-being or certain level of potential psychological damage may well also be incorporated into that. Um, and, that's, and therefore, the reason why you'll hear different things, therefore, is simply because 
any case you really get will usually go to very, very big rabbis, and they'll usually have to evaluate these things where there's no precise rule. If there's a threat to life and limb, that's very precise. How big a threat? How big a risk? What's a 10% risk? What's a 5% risk? What's a 20% risk? What about psychological damage? That's a very typical one. What happens if the, if the fetus is, is the, the child, if they're going to be born, is going to be severely disabled? What can parents cope with? What can't they cope with? These will vary from person to person, couple to couple, pregnancy to pregnancy. There's no black and white uh, rule about it. Um, the, where there might be a drop more leniency, according to some, is in the first 40 days. There you've got a, the Gemara describes that the fetus at that point is my other alma, just water. And, uh, and there, there may be grounds for a lot more leniency. In general, in general, Jewishly speaking, one doesn't want to be, there's no reproductive acts outside of marriage, right? That's not what one ought to be doing. And, uh, and therefore, but if a person, even in a marriage, doesn't want to have the child, so there's certain contraceptions that will be allowed, or in most circumstances, morning after pills are less ideal, but they're doable. Certainly, if God forbid a person went through a, an unwanted, um, an unwanted sexual intervention, a rape or something like that, then they'd certainly be able to do something. Almost all anaphic opinions we could say they could take an after, you know, a morning after pill or whatever it is to make sure it doesn't become pregnant. But that's, that's the rough lay of the land. So the basic, the, the, the kind of structure is, it's not like a full born life, but it's certainly not nothing. It's something we should take very seriously. Once 40 days crosses, we should take it much more seriously. The main grounds for an abortion will be life, limb, and psychological well-being. Exactly what the parameters of that will vary from person to person. So if you take the contemporary debate, let's say in America, we would not, if we're following Allah, follow either the standard views on the, on the what's called far right, but it's the main uh, platform of the Republican Party, or the view of the main platform of the Democrat Party. Right? We would not say abortion is just a right to do whenever just because you feel like it. We would also say it's not... Um, it's not something to be treated like a full-blown life, right? Somebody's been through rape or incest. That's a very good reason to make sure it doesn't become a proper pregnancy. Somebody just can't psychologically or certainly or physically cope with in a well-being way with the birth of a child. When he is in the pregnancy, you'd have to evaluate exactly where that goes as to what grounds abortion will become permissible. That's the basic answer. But you see in there why there's quite a large gray area that will mean you'll hear different things. Right, you'll hear some people interpret that more strictly, some less. And my experience as a rabbi is I've never, ever, ever obviously ruled on something. You have to be much greater than me to rule on this. But where people have come and it's gone up the chain to the really, really big people, is it very much varies by situation to situation. The, the rabbis really will really want to understand the couple, how they emotionally relate to what the, what the, doc, what the doctor's saying, what this one's saying, what that one's saying. And there'll be different answers in different situations given that kind of gray area parameters. Is there any follow-up question on that where I can move on to um, Gaia Shavya? Yeah, I'm just going to ask. Um, uh, wait, come back to me now. Whenever you're ready. Okay. The question of the challenges facing teenagers today. The basic bottom line challenge, and you'll hear this from everybody, but it's you'll experience yourself as self-esteem, self-worth, right? Many features of modern society make that a bigger issue in the modern 21st century Western world than in other cultures and civilizations around the globe and other eras of time, right? Is that the annoying voice inside that says you're a load of, I'm a load of rubbish, you know, that kind of voice that haunts the average teenager um, is natural anyway, because teenage years are complicated years. The years of the body shifts from child to adult. The brain is shifting from child to adult. To some degree, every teenager is a child and to some degree is already an adult. And there's a very confusing place to be at that particular point. Um, but add today's world. Today's world has a few big disadvantages. Number one, as a general world, it's a world where marriages are much less strong than they are in other cultures and have been in other times. And when a marriage fails, it has a high chance of leaving children with very deep self-doubt. Right? That's not something anybody can help us just, or even if marriage is technically together, but the parents at each other's throats, it's very, very hard to be a child going through that. Some people cope perfectly. Most people struggle with that. So you've got already now a high percentage across the whole of society like that. And now, if you've got lots of people struggling around your age, they're going to very often, people who are struggling, turn into bullies, for example. Every single person who bullies another person is struggling inside themselves, whether they're aware of it or not, right? You may find, some of you may find yourself being bullied, some of you may find yourself bullying others, right? 
but it's often, it's always coming from inner damage or inner struggle. Uh, even if it looks like the other person, you just want to hit them. It, there's something going on inside anybody who tries to exert power over others. And that's very, that's natural in all cultures and civilizations, bullying of teenagers by teenagers and so on. It gets much worse in the social media age. There's a lot of good things about social media, right? There's a very blessed age in many ways. But the ease with which somebody can cyber bully and the damage it can cause, and also the sense in which our worth is defined by how many likes we get, how people react to our posts. So my friend down the road has 500 times more likes than me. I start to feel maybe I'm a load of rubbish. Everybody loves their posts and laughs, but nobody seems to like mine. We're very on display and, and we're very vulnerable. We, we learn very much that our worth is how others relate to us. And that is very, very difficult. Very, very difficult, even for an adult much more so as a teenager. And the final issue, and this is a little bit more for women than for men, is as the taboos around, um, let's say, the sanctity and specialness of, of sexuality, of, of sex in particular, of the body, of the human body, kind of collapsed in the 1960s, particularly the way the male brains and female brains work is quite different on this, but the idea that you could post onto billboards women almost naked as a way of, save, of selling products or advertise products or put them on movies creates enormous self-esteem issues for teenage girls. Not just teenage, also for women in general, right? Because everything is now, how do I measure up to this? How do I measure up to this? How do I measure up to this? So all of these are factors. Also, the general promiscuity of society affects male uh, self-esteem too. But generally, so these combination of factors, natural complications of being a teenager, the fact that we're in a world where family is much, much weaker than it has been, the fact that we're in a world where promiscuity is much stronger, and particularly the way women's bodies are treated in society, and the fact that social media, all of these things conspire to make it very natural that a teenager today would look in the mirror and say, I wish I was completely different to how I am. I wish I had this one's brains, I wish I had this one's looks. I wish I could have humor like this one, popularity like that, this, this one's football skills, this one's this. And really, I'm just one big mistake. That's a little voice of self-doubt that lives inside us. So I'll just tell you straight off the bat something really, really important. You know, we're coming up to Purim as a festival. And if you think about it, why is the word Purim called Purim? This is the rabbi who's got to get the Devar Torah in now, you know. But it's actually very profoundly related to this exact issue. What does Purim mean? Any of you know? It's lottery. lottery, excellent, yeah, yeah. It's a lottery. Well, why is it called after a lottery? Why do you call a festival after a lottery? Because Haman chose the date to kill the Jews by a lottery. Now, one second. What's that got to do with the story? The story, if, if, imagine that he hadn't chosen a lottery. Would the story be different? There would still have been an anti-Semitic viceroy who wanted to kill the Jews. There'd still have been a Jewish queen who revealed she was Jewish in the last moment. That still have been, or the key moment, that still have been, the, the whole story would have been the same. So why do we call it after what seems to be an irrelevant detail? And more than that, it's not just an irrelevant detail. It's an anti-Semitic name. Why did Homer want to draw a lottery to kill the Jews? Because he said, you Jews stand for the idea that everything in this world is meaningful. I believe everything is meaningless. And I'm going to rub salt in your wounds by picking the day that you're all going to die in the most meaningless possible way. So why would we name the festival after a narrative irrelevant detail that's actually just an anti-Semitic ideology? What a strange thing to do. Except that's the point. Every other Jewish festival celebrates big moments, big people, big miracles. Purim celebrates the value of every single person. He needed all the Jewish people to come together to pray. Esther wasn't seen as somebody particularly great before, but she stood up in the right moment. And it teaches you that this, it really is teaching you that everything in history is God's plan. There's a big plan that includes everything. And what, in essence, it's saying is, there isn't a single person in this world who's a mistake. If God wants you in the world, if you're in the world right now, it's because your unique genetics, upbringing, life struggles, and so on, gives you something to offer the world that nobody else on this planet can offer. If everybody else in the world was, was doing exactly where they need to be and you weren't yet, the world would be missing something. And like the cells in the human body, if a cell is doing the wrong thing, it could 
threaten the whole body, right? If the cell's doing the right thing, it helps the whole body achieve perfection. That's the idea that every single one of us is meant to look at ourselves and say, and say there's something that I have to offer the world. I may not know what it is yet, but the, we actually, I don't know if, you know, if any of you pray in the morning ever, you do have the Jewish prayer, you'll see that before we get to Shema Yisrael, the prayer we say before is, Ahavarabah, how much love you have God for us. Right? If we could feel, you know how nice it is when you, if you do post on social media and 100 people like it or 200 people or 500 people, wow, you feel really good. Imagine the infinite creature of the universe comes and says, like, you know, love you. That's powerful. And that's something to tap into. Now, person believes, doesn't believe in God. The sense that, that imagine there's something in the right creation of the universe who loves you, values you infinitely. That is a very, very deep root of self-esteem. And if you don't like that theologically, just try to incorporate the message that there's something that what Judaism is teaching us is, so one of the many things it's teaching us is that we have infinite worth exactly as we are, with all our struggles and all our difficulties and everything we're going through, it's okay. That's normal and it's part of the value of who we, part of our struggle in life that would eventually allow us to do something special in the world we may not even know, something that we have to bring to the world. That I think is, is um, if you're asking what's the, the main struggle of a teenager, I'd say that's what it is. And that is the main pathway. And you shouldn't expect it to be resolved. It's very, very normal to feel any of those things I was saying. It doesn't make you strange, it doesn't make you weird, and it certainly doesn't make you bad in any way. It's certainly, 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 the only thing that's common to all of it is that voice that says you're no good is wrong. That's the most important thing. That voice is not true. It doesn't mean you won't feel it, it doesn't mean you won't hear it, it doesn't mean it won't shout inside you, but you should just be aware that it's not true. And, and uh, you're of infinite value, and that's, uh, that's um, Exactly for the genes you have, exactly for that bringing out exactly for what makes you different is exactly what makes you special is exactly the point. Any follow ups on that before I move on to the question of, of bad things in the world, which is related? Okay. And the reason it's related is because at the root of all of this is two things. Number, and it's going to relate to the Mashiach question too, so it's all linked. The question of bad things happening is ultimately a question of perspective. And what I mean by that is, is this. We, bad or good, depends on what we think should be done compared to what is done, right? Well, actually, I'll explain to you soon that the question why do bad things happen is really more than one question. There's a bunch of questions that connect together. But fundamentally, from a Jewish perspective, we would expect that God sees a lot more than we see, right? We get this all the time, you as 17-year-olds or whatever age, is that the average age here? 17, 18, 16? 16, 17. 16, 17. Okay. You as 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, or whatever age you are, have far more perspective about the world than, let's say, a three-year-old kid. So I don't know if any of you have three-year-old siblings or nephews or nieces, but if you do, or if you ever, you know, you could imagine anyway that you're a three-year-old nephew, niece, and your three-year-old doesn't understand the world as well as you do. And on their third birthday, they get a football. Okay, and they're playing around with this football, and maybe it's one of those houses that has a front garden near a main road. And you're watching from the window, and you're filming, and it's so cute, and it's amazing. And all of a sudden, somebody must have left the gate open because that ball is now rolling down the pathway in towards the main road. What's your three-year-old nephew or niece doing at that point? They're running after the ball. Why? because emotionally they are connected to that little football, a bit like we're connected to all our friends and family. It's everything for them. They have very little concept that there's a danger to this moving vehicles in the road. The only thing they know about roads and cars is it can get them in trouble with daddy and mummy when they go into the road. That's about it. They generally speaking, so they're going to go running after that ball to try to save everything that's valuable to them. Now you're watching this and you're seeing it happen and what do you do? So you call after them and say, stop, stop, stop. But they ignore you. So then what do you do? You run after them. If you, look, you jump out a window, you do it. You run and you, go, you grab them just before they get into the road. Where's the ball now? It's in the road. There's a car's already knocked it a few meters that way, another one that way. This ball is moving down the road. The cars are coming one after another. The kid is kicking and screaming and going crazy. The, uh, suddenly a lorry comes and 
that's it, the ball's gone. And the kid is going absolutely crazy. And what would be going through their mind if they could think like an adult would be, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is my all-loving uncle or aunt or whoever exactly it is, older brother or sister, parent, whoever it might be, doing this? And you realize that the conceptual gap between your perspective and theirs is so vast, you can't even begin to explain to them what you're doing. Now think about that gap, a 70-year-old and a three-year-old. And now think about a much, much bigger gap, a human being and an infinite creature of the universe. That gap is vastly, vastly larger, infinitely larger right, than the gap between us and a three-year-old, or us and an ant, or us and anything that could be a lot smaller, finitely smaller than us, right? We get to see, of you know, billions of people on the planet, we maybe know a few dozen, a few hundred, right? We get to live, of the whole vast history of the universe, a few decades, in the Jewish thinking that souls can be born in and out of this world and potentially be reincarnated in an afterlife, we see none of it. So our perspective is so small. Our understanding of an event is so small that what seems to us one way, if you look thousands of years later and you look from the perspective of souls coming in and out of the world and afterlife and all, it might look completely different. But that's exactly, again, the Purim story teaches exactly that principle since we're just a few days before Purim that what happened in the middle of the story looked like the greatest tragedy possible, and by the end it had turned into a festival, into a yontav, right? So that doesn't mean that things aren't painful. It doesn't mean there aren't events that we should call good and bad. We should call some things good and bad. There, is good, there are good choices made by humans, and there are evil choices made by humans. There are choices and natural things that lead to people feeling happy, and there are choices and natural events that lead to people feeling in immense levels of pain. So there's pain in the world. There, is, there are things that we should cry about in the world. There are things we should rejoice in in the world. But the question of, of why God's doing it will depend completely from God's perspective, not ours. Now, you could ask a follow-up question, which is, okay, but why does God allow painful things to happen? Now, I can't stop that three-year-old having a painful experience. But if God's doing everything for the good, why doesn't he let it all feel good? Why do we have to go through such difficult things? Why do there have to be tears and, and horrible things happen in the world? And here I'm going to point out two things. The first is this. Is all pain bad? Can you think of pain that is sometimes good? Make a mistake. What's that? Make a mistake. You're okay, yes. Pain can teach you not to do so. It can be a great teacher, right? You make a mistake, get into pain, physical or mental or emotional or so on. Where else could pain be good? There's actually a lot of examples. Any examples where pain's good? Have you ever put your hand near a fire? Yeah, go on, what are you going to say? A woman giving birth. A woman giving birth, okay, yeah. Now, that, that's actually a good example of where something painful is happening that is also a good thing, right? But it would be even better if it was no pain at all, right? Where's an example where the pain itself is good? I just get you, right? Put your hand near a fire. Why is that pain good? Because your hand's about to get destroyed. The thing that's going to save it is pain. Pain gives a quick impulse, like, get out of this. In fact, the vast majority of physical pain is your body telling you you're in a dangerous situation. Stop it right now. Right? A child gets a pain in their stomach and they think, the, or anywhere in their body, and they think the problem is I'm in pain. An adult realizes the problem is not pain. I wait for the, the cup crackling to, to pause. The problem is not pain. Pain is not the problem. Pain is information that there is a problem. The reason the stomach's hurting or another part of the body might be a virus or a bacteria, or a toxin, or something is doing damage. And the best thing you could have in that situation is information, something saying, stop it, get it healed. So go to the doctor, find out what it is, get it cured, and then also take a painkiller. What about other types of pain? So what Judaism does not teach is that people individually get painful lives means they did something wrong. But it does teach something not unrelated. Let me give you or a different angle let me give you this. What is the worst thing that ever happened to the world from a Jewish perspective? Holocaust. Holocaust, Holocaust is certainly very high up, the darkest hour of humanity. 
Even worse than that. Destruction of the second temple, yeah. First temple, yeah. Even worse than that. Go on. Slaves in Egypt. Even worse than all of those. Go on. The flood, right? So the flood story reads really, like almost the whole world wiped out. And even worse than that, go on, yeah. Kiki Daukanet, and you're both going to say that. Excellent. So this room has just gone through. You, you've covered every single possible angle. You're all right. Those are the worst. Those are really, really terrible things. But the coming, being kicked out of the Garden of Eden is the worst. And I say well, that's not worse than lots of people getting killed until you realise there actually is every single person getting killed. You see, we read the Garden of Eden story when we're like six years old, and then we kind of don't really think about it much again, and it's like, oh, it's this little children's story. I want to spend two minutes just understanding what's going on because it's the story of everything, and it's going to touch exactly your question, right? So let's, what does the word Eden mean? Garden of Eden. It's okay, this is not an easy question. Some of the questions I've asked today are ones you would expect to know. This one's not easy. It's one of the Torah's words for time. What's the modern Hebrew word for time? Zaman. Yeah, yeah, very good. But that's not in the Torah. The word Zaman does not appear in the Torah. It does appear in Tanakh. It appears in biblical works like Kohenes, Ecclesiastes, but it never appears in the Torah. Eden is a word for time that is also preserved in modern Hebrew in words like, for those of you who speak modern Hebrew, Odenu, Adayan, any word that's an ayin, dalad, nun is a time word. It also has the word meaning of the word pleasure as well. Now, so it's a garden of time. Now, one second, what is a garden of time? Well, in every culture and civilization, a garden is a, something, an environment, arena where you put things or gather things. For example, what is the simple English word for a zoological garden? A zoo, right. Okay, good, just checking you're awake. And what does that mean? It means a place where you gather zoology or animals. What is a botanical garden, a place where you gather? Plants, right, good, okay. So uh, what's a garden of time? A place where all of time is experienced. Who is doing physics A-level? Any of you doing? A few of you doing. Do you, I don't know, I don't know what's on the curriculum nowadays, especially in... Uh... Well, you're doing physics <laughs> Okay, okay, physicists among us. I don't know if you do any of relativity at this age, if you do, if you, if you, at this stage, if you do the B theory of time, have you come across any of that? It doesn't matter, you know, forget it. It's not, it's not important. Here's what's important. Here's what's important. The Garden of Eden is full of time. Adam moves across time the way we move across space. And what that means is, what that means is that the experience, whatever it is, it's not a place you could go back in a time machine and find. It's not like there's somewhere on Earth, although there are opinions there's a parallel on Earth, but it's not like you could go on Earth and say, oh, this is the Garden of Eden. I'm talking about the most literal reading of Torah here. No, you, it's not a place in space and time. It's all of reality from a different dimension. And in that reality, have you ever asked yourself this question from a Jewish perspective? Why do I have to suffer because some Adam messed up in the garden? Let me go back in the garden and see if I could do better. Live forever, etc. You know what the Jewish answer is? We were all in that garden. There was a single soul called Adam. Didn't have a body because only on the way out of Eden do the say got garments of skin. So this is a world beyond the body. It's a different dimension of reality. And what does the word Adam mean in Hebrew, even in modern Hebrew to this day? Humanity, Adam is ground, excellent. Adam is humanity as a whole, is mankind. So there's a single soul that is the whole of humanity. You and I and everybody else in this world is like a part of that original Adam. It was divided into two, into male and female, Ish and Ishan. The goal was to come back together and come to God. That was the whole purpose. And I'm not going to go through every line of the story, but basically the serpent, whatever that is, says, you can be the center of reality. And Adam says, oh, I want to be the center of reality. I want to feel the world through my eyes. That's what the verse says. You'll open your eyes. You'll see the world through your little eyes. And the moment Adam chooses to be the center, self-centered, suddenly every part of the soul of Adam wants to be the center of reality. And all of a sudden it isn't one. All of a sudden, in the Kabbalistic teachings, it shatters and fragments and becomes billions of broken pieces that are pulled out of the Garden of Time 
each one enters space-time as we experience it, as part of the spatial world, the biological world, you and I and every human being who's ever walked this planet is a part of that soul of Adam, that broken soul. And because each one of us sees the world through our eyes, we struggle to understand others. Relationships can fall apart very easily because you said something and it hurt me a lot. You never meant it badly. I said something back to you. I never meant it that badly, but it hurt you a lot. And we retaliate and we this and we see from, oh, if you've got two of your friends arguing, you can understand this one's perspective. You can understand that one's perspective, but neither of them can understand each other. That's the broken world we're in. It tears apart families. It tears apart communities. It destroys friendships. It tears apart countries and nations. It sets people at war with each other. It's I can't see the world through your eyes and you can't see through my eyes. In this broken world, which we spoke about earlier, people's self-esteem, the devastation, murder, math, all the terrible things going on in the world are this broken world. Into this world, each one of us enters for a small amount of time. And our job is to heal this world one relationship at a time. And the Jewish people's job is to build a unity of the Jewish people and ultimately the whole of mankind. And we'll come back to that because that's the Messianic era. And on the way through that journey, the worst thing that would be is we enter this terrible, this world in its broken state and we do nothing about it. It feels fine. Everybody else is struggling and suffering, but I feel fine. And that's why God makes sure this world has pain. Pain is information that is a problem. In this broken, devastated, dying world where so many people are feeling pain, we have to feel the pain too. But the goal is not to feel the pain. The goal is to take that pain first. If it's in our own lives, we have to heal through it. And that can take many years of self-care and looking after ourselves, maybe therapy and various other processes. Sometimes it can take, at this age, it can feel like it's going to be forever, but it's not. It's things we can get through. But when we are on the other side, is to turn it into an energy of healing that brings goodness to the whole world. When I was uh, in university, it's going back quite a long time, there was a, a book that had just come out at the time called The Boy Called It. How much longer do we have? Okay, good. Boy Called It, it was written by a guy called David Palzer. According to the book, assuming it's true, he'd written about the, own, the most intense levels of abuse he'd been through. He was called it by his own mother, who never wanted him. She used to burn cigarette butts out in, in him, in his arm. He used to send him to school in filthy clothes as a child, which meant he got obviously bullied and terribly treated. He went to foster homes and this, the other. He had a, a really horrific, horrific childhood. Took huge resilience to survive. And when he got through the other side, he decided to write this book so that if there's anybody out there suffering, they can use it as an inspiration to get through themselves. It became a runaway bestseller. He became very wealthy. He then sent but the other books. He started using his money to help others and then eventually built a whole foundation that would have centers where kids could go to having difficult times, where they could lobby legislators. I don't know all the details of what he did. But you see now, we cannot say why he went through what he went through. But we can say that potentially there are tens of thousands of people whose lives were turned around because of how he came out from it the other side. Every single person who has ever done great moral revolutions in this world, great or small, is somebody who either went through pain or was sensitive to the pain of others and was driven to bring healing and goodness into the world. So we cannot know why a specific person goes through a difficult thing in this world. We don't know. That's the infinite vision of God that's not ours. We know the souls come into the world, come out the other side. We all have jobs to do inside this world. These are all classical Jewish teachings. Our job, if we're going through pain or we know somebody else who is, is to help through the healing process. But our longer term job is to feel what's wrong with this world and bring it to healing. And what does it look like when we do bring it to healing? That's exactly what the Messianic era is. What is it like when we can learn to see the world through somebody else's eyes? What is it like when the whole of first Israel and then ultimately the whole of mankind becomes one? That's, that becoming one is the goal. You know, a human body is lots and lots of cells, trillions of cells. But if you take quadrillions and quadrillions of cells, all the bacteria on planet Earth, vastly outnumber us. We probably have more bacteria cells in our body than human cells, right? All the bacteria on planet Earth are gigantically enormous in number. Between all of them, as far as we know, is not a shred of consciousness. 
as far as we can tell, they couldn't think about, never mind, do a simple sum like one plus one equals two. But put a tiny fraction, a few trillion of them together, these cells, into a human body, give each one a different role to play, right? Each one, and I'm gonna step off. And all of a sudden, you have a human being with a brain, with a mind, capable of understanding the mathematics and the laws of the entire universe. Capable of relating to a creator, to moral good and bad. Capable of rethink. You can now, can you just imagine if you take all of humanity and bring it together into one? Imagine what level we'll be able to achieve together. Imagine what level of super grasping, almost like build a mind greater than all of us, that we can all be a part of, and grasp the oneness of God and go beyond any hatred or jealousy, that state of super consciousness will basically be the recreation of Adam as one. The recreation of the garden of Eden state of mind. So I've touched upon, I don't know if I've fully gone through everything you wanted to ask, I've touched a lot of issues to do with the wider about things happen and to do the messianic era. So I'll open up to more questions on this or anything else, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, sure. you talk about the messianic era, who yes. was the messianic era? Excellent, good. The Messianic era, the word Messiah in, in, Messiah in Judah, in Hebrew is Mashiach. Mashiach means the anointed one. It's a word for a Jewish king. Any Davidic king was anointed with a special oil and a special ceremony. But the purpose of a king is not political power. The Torah has very few laws of kings. They're mainly about they can't have too much power. The purpose of Malfut, of kingship, is that which integrates the many into one. So human body is like a little kingship. It takes the cells and produces out of all of them something much greater than all of them. The, the proverbial, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What the messianic lead has to do is bring peace, first within the Jewish people, ultimately with all the nations around, but they have to eventually get the house of God rebuilt in Jerusalem, meaning the Beis HaMikdash. They have to bring all the Jewish people together and then from there, all of humanity together. And that's the role of the Mashiach. That has not happened yet. Right, that's still waiting to happen, but that's the kind of brings history to where it needs to culminate. Why hasn't it happened? Why well, hasn't it happened? Mainly because we haven't done the job we're meant to do, right? According to the Torah, it's we have two main jobs that divide into 613 how we treat others and how we relate to God, right? We have a relation with God, which is a certain group of mitzvahs that we're meant to be keeping, and how we relate to one another, which is other mitzvahs we're meant to be keeping. And <laughs> until we cross a threshold of doing that correctly, there isn't enough spirituality and also not enough wherewithal. Remember, somebody lived a life against God's will, right? And then this all happens. They won't be able to sustain themselves in that world. So we need, there needs to be enough people doing the right thing that that world can come and everybody can be, or most people can be a part of it. So why doesn't the Messiah come now and heal us of our wrong and guide us in the right path to God? Excellent question. So what's your name? Dylan. Dylan, brilliant Dylan. The reason is because God wants all of us to be a part of it. If, if the Messiah just made us right, then we didn't use our free will for that. The whole point is each of us has our free will. And it's when we use our free will so that each of us played a part in the story, God wants that final chapter to be one in which many of us have starring roles, ideally all of us, which means all of us did something to live up to our potential. All of us made free will choices and brought goodness into the world. Then we can be part of the final chapter. Anyone who didn't use their free will for that, but then something happened that forced them to do good, they're not in that final chapter. And we want, or God wants, as many of his creations to be in that final chapter as possible. That's our understanding. Yeah. Just your name, is it? Yali. Yali. Yeah. Great, yeah. If the Torah was written so long, how is it able to keep up? And like the modern day changes? Yeah, that's an excellent question. How does it do that? And the answer is, um, I mean, is that an infinite God can put things in the Torah that are extremely relevant to that time? but have principles that can be applied into every single time. Even the Talmud, which is the main source of Jewish law today, the way the Talmudic rabbis did it is by testing ideas to, not just giving a law, but what's the reasoning behind it, and testing ideas to extremes, so that you can, nowadays, technology comes up, the rabbis can always go back into the Talmud and Torah and find out which, which concept there applies to it. So with electrical issues on Shabbos, or, or with uh, you know artificial intelligence, or all these various things, you can always just to work out what the question is. You'll find the root of the idea is still there. And then if you know this, the very first division of what was called conjoined twins. I'm sure you've heard someone talk about this before. That's twins who uh, who shared a body, but where they were joined at the heart. The first ruling that ever took place on it was was by an Orthodox rabbi. 
because it happened in 1977 in America. There was no law yet governing it in America. And the couple were a religious Jewish couple. And the surgeon, he later became the Surgeon General of the United States. His name was Everett Koop. He insisted that he wants to wait for the rabbi's decision before he decides. And I was actually quoted in various court cases as well. But it's because the Torah is, I guess, God's infinity. He can, he can raise laws that seem totally relevant at that time, but can carry relevance onwards. And in the oral tradition, in the Torah and the, and the Talmud, the way it's done is by focusing on the concepts. In the yeshiva, there's a huge amount of time learning Gemara to extract the concepts, the concepts, the concepts. The concepts are the ones that can be applied into any situation. And the, so the Gemara's hypotheticals that includes aeroplanes, even though there were no aeroplanes, artificial insemination, even though there wasn't any, because it just tests ideas to the extreme and they often become very useful later in history. You've even got things that can apply very much nowadays, like extension of life. You know, um, I mean, there are, maybe we'll want to be able to resurrect bodies, but we already talked about that in the Talmud, right? We've got to, maybe they'll produce lab-produced pork that is kosher, but the Gemara discusses the day when eating pig will be kosher, right? Is that like, so there's a lot of interesting things there. Yeah. Why isn't it an interpretation then? As in, if any things that we have were from so long ago, yeah. why can't we just make up our rules from that? Excellent question, I'm sorry. Uh, Jane. Jane, right, so the, the question, excellent question. So there's, there's rules about interpretation built into it, okay? So the Torah itself says that when you're stuck on how to understand the law, you're meant to go to the body of the Supreme Court that exists in your days. Now, we don't have a judicial Supreme Court nowadays, right? It was the 70 rabbis, 70 judges who would be in Jerusalem. We don't, in later, second temple period, it was called the Sanhedrin. Since we've been in exile, we've never had it. So we don't have license to interpret the text and make anything legally binding from it. At the same time, we're always interpreting the Talmudic law because we're trying to apply it to new situations. So how do you decide what that is? Well, you really want, it's like, how do you decide anything? How do you decide a new more scientific theory? You need to go to the experts, the top experts in the world. How did they study? Is there debate? Is it unanimous? So when a new, just take a situation of a new technology comes along, typically, the people like me, who are very lo relatively low-ranking rabbis, who wait till the real super scholars really, un really have total grasp of everything, rule on it, and either they'll be unanimous or there'll be some room for, for a scope of potential debate on it, and we operate in that sense. But I personally, to just read the Torah however I want to, I have a first of all, none of us have a license to, to reinterpret the Torah right now without that court, but none of us certainly have a license to read. And imagine we did. If we all just interpreted it the way we wanted it, it would be a free for all. There'd be no, no Torah whatsoever, right? I'd, I'd say, really, it means pork is kosher. And you'll say, well, Shabbat really means this one, and that really, this. then we're just playing whatever games we want to, right? In every relationship, there's always got to be the bit that we bring to the relationship, right? Which, let's say, interpretation. And then there's always what the objective desires of the other is. And that's true in a relationship with God. It's true in a relationship with the Jewish nation. There's, fact, there's things out there that can't be changed, and things out there that can. That answers your question. Yeah, back um, to you. If, like, we're, we're the Jewish people believe in one God, right? Yeah. How many religions on, uh, what's like the Jewish view on? Because they say there's this God, like, well, these are two types of God, but obviously we don't believe it's true, but we acknowledge that it exists. Yeah. Um, How do you relate to other faiths? So you should actually know it's an interesting thing. What we mean by God, and for example, what Muslims mean by Allah is the same creator. So how are we so different? We're different in something else, which is in, in revelation of the law. We're not different in the theology of God. Within Christianity, a lot depends on how they understand the Trinity. Most Christians say there's one infinite creator who made the universe, but then depending on how they understand the Trinity, they may or may not have the same concept as us. Unitarians more likely to be like us, some Trinitarians not. But the principle of a non-spatial, non-temporal creator of the universe is something shared by the vast majority of mankind today and the vast majority, probably the majority of religions, religious streams and denominations today, right? Um, it depends on what you call a religious stream and denomination, so that came. But uh, certainly by billions of people. Where we differ is like this. With Christianity, Christians agree with us that there's one creator, made, God who made the universe and gave the Jewish people a Torah. What they then say is that we failed. And because we failed, God sent his own son, right, to die for the sins of, of mankind. And now it's all about having faith in that son of God. And... And, um, and that applies to all human beings, and the New Testament is, is by the Old Testament. Most Christians say the Old Testament is. There are some who would say it. Some would say it's binding for us, but in the main, that will be there for you. So where we agree is there's a God who gave the Torah to the Jews. Where we disagree is did he change his mind, right? 
With Muslims, it's slightly different. You could read the Quran to say that the Torah of the Jews of today is the Torah of God, but at least since about the 10th to the 11th centuries of Ibn Hazm, and it's generally, of, generally nowadays interpreted by most Muslims, they believe we corrupted the Torah, and the Torah we have today is not the original given to Moshe. And secondly, they believe then that there, there was a prophecy, Muhammad got, had a prophecy, and, and the Quran, most of them would say, is binding on all of us. Okay, so where you stuck, so what well, they all agree is there's a God who gave the Torah to the Jews at some point, right, uh, at Sinai. And Christians would say, yes, he did, but since we failed, he changed your mind and chose them. Most Muslims would say, the Hassan would disagree with, would be more, would say, yes, the Torah is still binding for us, but the majority would say, no, we corrupted the Torah text. And, and therefore the Torah we have today is wrong and we should all be following Muhammad, right? Mormons, um, Sikhs, many, many religions agree with this basic starting point. There's one God who gave the Torah to the Jews, put down the line, some prophecy moves as well. Okay, so we're not, we don't really disagree with most of them on the fundamental. We disagree that then God changed his mind afterwards. That's what we would have disagreed with. Now, we also believe that Judaism is not just about Jews, meaning God has a role for the Jewish people, but ultimately he has an all of humankind. And that's why what he really had is a covenant with Adam, with Noah, how we understand these, of the seven laws or seven principles, right? Sanctity of life, you can't kill, you can't steal, right? Uh, blaspheme, not, not, not to have idolatry, you know, it's what we call ethical monotheism, not to turn him off a living animal and to have justice systems, right? Integrity of marriage. So that you have like seven basic principles. And if, as long as humans live up to those, Right? Or even if they don't fully live up a trial, or whatever it is, there's a principle, chasideh umasaholam, righteous among the nations of the world, can also have a portion of the world to come just like the righteous among the Jewish people. Okay? Um, so for us, now, if they were in biblical Israel, they would have to also accept the Torah law as the source of it. Whether they do or not, in, in, when we're in exile, that's open for debate, but very likely not, as it is most of them do seem to accept that. So it may well be um, that... Muslims and Christians, and in fact, lots and lots and lots of faiths, depending how you understand their theology or not, lots of people in the world might well be living under the Noahide covenant in one form or another, and, uh, and lots of people in the world might, well, we don't know the numbers, it could be enormous numbers making the world to come. Not, same with us, we don't know. But So that's a long winded. but in other words, we're not as different from a lot of the theologies we think. Our major debate with most, uh, certainly most Christians and Muslims, is not God per se, although there may be some of the Trinity, um, it's not whether he gave the Torah per se, it's whether the Torah we have today is still binding upon us. Okay, yeah. I have a question. Um, if we examine like, Jesus' teachings or whatever, they're not bad teachings, so why can't Jews follow, like, follow those teachings as well as the teachings of the Old Testament? It's a very good question. I would say for the most part what you'll find is what he's teaching are values in the... Torah and the Old Testament, yeah, right? Exactly. So, but for us, they've got to be balanced with other values, right? If you try to teach some values without others, you always create a misaligned picture. It could be they're good teachings for non-Jews, meaning if somebody out there wants to say he's a good teacher for those who want to follow the Noahide covenant or something, that may well be true. You know, I'm not a big enough expert to be able to say that. Um, what for us is missing is an enormous amount of missing from those teachings. Right? They, may, they, they may be emphasizing parts of Torah, fantastic, but let's go to the Torah itself to find the balance of where all these different teachings are. So what, so what about, because I've heard of this movement before, it's called Jews for Jesus, what about yeah. them? Are they no, because, Jews or? Well, we do not agree that Jesus is the Messiah, is Mashiach, because Mashiach, according to us, which is according to the old prophecies of, of, the, of the Torah and the specific Tanakh, there's a whole bunch of things that Mashiach has to do before he can be anointed king of Israel. Mashiach, Jesus was not anointed king of, king of Israel. Right? He, 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 um, he, was, uh, he didn't build the second, he didn't build the third base of English. He didn't bring peace to all humanity, right? So that's why even Christians agree, they say there's going to be another coming, right? We just say, you know, the prophecies are what they are, and that's what Mashiach's going to do. So we're not, this, is, this since Jesus has come, has not been the era of peace that the prophecies were talking about. Now again, I'm not saying it's to not Christianity, I'm just explaining why we don't agree with that, that line of view. And, and like I say, we don't think God's changed his mind. The Torah itself, God says he's not going to change his mind. That's why we just, now we're not trying to convert Christians to us. We're happy if they keep the Noahide law, right? Fantastic. But what we want is for ourselves to understand that when Hashem said, this is your mission, this is the rules, this is what, you know. And remember, look, many of us grew up in homes that are less religious or whatever it is. 
is Judaism is never all or nothing. It's about growing and trying to take on more, right? It's just like becoming a good human. We've always got to be striving in the direction of the Torah. We've always got to try and do what we can to do, to do more of it. But by doing that, we're bringing a healing to everybody in the world. And that's our mission that we have to do. And, that's we, and, and, we, and we do not accept that the world has achieved anything remotely resembling perfection because it's got so much more to go still. So can, uh, because Christians believe in the Old Testament, they accept it as part of the Bible, yeah. can they strive to follow the Torah as well? There are a large parts of Torah which somebody not Jewish is allowed to do. There are some parts of Torah somebody not Jewish shouldn't do because they're specifically for the Jewish people. So Shabbat is an example. So they can have a day of rest, right? They could decide to switch off their phones, but they couldn't absorb uh, do Shabbat exactly as we do it. Uh, that, that is an example they wouldn't be able to do. Um, but large parts of Torah they can do. Listen, they don't have to do. And why would, what, you know, like let them, the focus on the Noahide law, that will be a good thing. And that is a good thing. Is, again, I think a lot of human beings out there are in one way or another. Ideally, they take it straight from, from the Old Testament, from the Torah. So it is that it is hot. It's sacred to them, but depending on the theology of Christianity, it will depend on how much they think it's been removed as, as, in, as, as a binding system. It's, 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 uh, it's to do with the person. It's not specifically one umbrella. Uh, yeah, well, Christianity is enormous, got hundreds of, yeah. hundreds of sects, so we can't, yeah, yeah. But any religion that big is going to have lots of sects and lots of interpretations. But the key point's us, right? We are here to keep Hashem's Torah, to do the best that we can in, our, in Hashem's Torah. And through that, that's how we help bring the Messianic era. That's how we help bring all the healing to the world. That's our job, and that's the job we've got to focus on, right? We can encourage non-Jews to be as good human beings as they can be and keep the Noahide law, and many do, and you know, and so on, and that's also fantastic. But we've got to remember what we're doing. We've been given, our ancestors were given a mission, and it's, it comes with a big price. The price is anti-Semitism. The price is persecution of the Jew in history. Right? But the reward for it is that we got to play that a very pivotal role in the bringing together perfection of humanity. And that's something, that's something we should be proud of, and I think not arrogant about, not arrogant about, but something we should take that response, I think we should take the responsibility seriously and see it as a privilege even if it's very difficult sometimes, right? And, you know, nowadays it's very easy to feel, I wish I wasn't Jewish. Right? Or, you know, it would be so much easier, right? It's, uh, but okay, all, all great things in this world are not easy. They're all not easy. And we don't need to be perfect Jews. We just, we need to be better than we were trying to be the best that we can be. Just one more question. Is there any time for one more question? I feel like Harry's been waiting for Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Do you mind? Yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry. sorry, yeah. Last question, guys. Guy, I just want to say, by the way, it's been two things really complimentary of you. The depth and sophistication of thinking in your questions and the paying attention, despite the fact half of you sitting at the back there and there's feudal, you know, really impressive and, and I think, you know, fantastic. You should, a little pat on your back, you know. But, uh, but no, it's not a given. In today's world, where everything's bing, 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 out for our screens, the people that focus and think deeply about these really important questions is, is so special. So yeah, go on, Harry. Uh, you mentioned quite a while ago like, the concept of consciousness. Yeah. So I'm just curious, so how would you define mm. what consciousness is? Yeah. Um, and how would you say what does and doesn't happen? Okay, two excellent questions. The short answer to the first question is I don't know because we don't yet have a good scientific definition of it. It's one of those things that hopefully in our lifetime we'll get a much better handle on. It may be one of those things that will invert a lot of the laws of physics when we discover it. So, you know, like, like the speed of light to, to, to physics. We don't know. So I can't speculate as to what it is. I believe probably it's part of the natural development of, of um, animals and humans to get different types of... I think that's it. It, it certainly includes awareness, right? a sense of self, or at least... Our problem is we can't get into the brain of an animal, so we can't feel what it's like to be them, right? But they certainly exhibit traits that seem to have some kind of awareness, right? Um, certain animals seem to already have an image of themselves. What's the way we normally prove that? By can they, in a mirror, recognize it's them eventually, or behave as if they recognize it's them? So dogs seem to be able to do that. Certain apes seem to be able to do that. Dolphins, they think, could probably do that. And, and elephants, right? Most animals can't do that. Like a cat can't necessarily do rat, can't necessarily do that. So what exactly that means, hard to know, but there's something a bit more going on with those animals. Humans seem to have something much, much stronger. We have a very, we can abstract and think about ourselves from the outside. We could do a huge amount of, of reflective work. Our will also extends to a much wider array of choices, individually, collectively, than animals have. 
more, we, we will hold ourselves to much higher levels of moral accountability than animal would. It's hard to pinpoint exactly anything we do, some animal does a bit of somewhere. But there's definitely a very, like somebody wants to say, what's the difference between humans and animals? Everything we do, they do. Well, they don't build smartphones. Like, now you can say they have toolkit make, yeah, but there's vast differences somewhere in the system. Um, what all of this is, it seems there's some evolutionary or other process at work that brings more and more unity to things. So plants take in organic matter and turn it into unified organic thing. Animals will take that in some kind of awareness, and, 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 right? Humans seem to have taken it to a whole different level, the ability to mass organize societies, for example, and things like that. And all of these are portals and access in different levels to more and more what we call the divine light. That is, if you like kind of the soul, of everything in the world has some kind of soul in the sense that it's God's will. And as these things develop more and more, there's more and more ability within physical material things to have awareness of all this kind of stuff. So I have not been able to answer your question largely because I don't think we've got a scientific definition of exactly what consciousness is, but it does seem to entail those sorts of processes. And, and the final stage in consciousness from a Jewish perspective will be that Edenic oneness that we'll all be able to be part of. It's called the world to come. And those who live the sort of lives that they would be not embarrassed of when they're face to face with God will be a part of it, and those who don't won't be a part of it. And then there's a process of potential burning through for those souls in the afterlife to come back into it. But ultimately, it's about resurrecting that state of consciousness and all of us, all those who live the sort of life we should try to live, being able to part the have their own consciousness in there. Okay, so I'm not sure, because I couldn't give a full answer, I, I, because just, you know, I don't blame myself for that. That's where, where the scientific world is right now. So the best mind's time. Okay, it seems like we've, we've, we're a bit out of time. I want to say this, that the questions you've asked are really, really excellent. I would say more than that, that part of what allows us to grow as people and as Jewish people, especially in this world, all of Jewish Torah study is based on questions. You open a page of Gemara, it's attack this, question this, every assumption has to be, and that allows us to go a bit deeper. And hopefully some of what I said here has allowed us to form a bit of a deeper picture that we might have had before. Right? And hopefully what that then does is creates a bit of a better picture that then allows even better questions to take us to the next level and onwards. And it's not endlessly going around in a circle. It's actually going in a linear line of growing and developing and growing and developing as we build a stronger and better, hopefully, better picture. But most importantly of all, what I said before, if this is what we're on, this journey through history where all of us get to play a role, then... I, I give you as a rabbi, I give you a little blessing that Hashem should give each, each one of us the ability to realize how worthwhile we are, to understand what's special about us, and the ability to do things in this world, whether we think they're great or small, that will ultimately have a very positive effect on the world and bring us into that final chapter. And with that, I wish everybody a wonderful Purim. <laughs>